Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <clears throat> In analyzing the great dua of Al Joshan Al Kabir, we mentioned last night that this dua is narrated by a Shaykh Al Kafami. In his book of Al Misbah, and he tells us the story of how we receive this dua. Jibrail comes down upon Rasulullah during one of the battles, and the Holy Prophet is wearing an armor. He tells him, Take off this Joshan, this armor, and instead recite this beautiful dua of Al Joshan Al Kabir, Fa'innahu Amanun Laka Wale Ummatik. For this dua serves as protection for you and for your nation, for your ummah. And we explained last night that this dua protects us in four ways. Number one, if we recite it, and we said that it is recommended to recite at least, at least once during the month of Ramadan, and specifically the first night of Ramadan, and we recite it during the Layali al-Qadr. So this is number one. Number two, the one that holds it with him receives protection. Number three, the one that keeps him, keeps the dua in his house. And number four, finally, the one that writes the dua on his kafan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us many forms of protection through this dua. Number one, we said Allah protects you from any harm and danger, from any sickness that may afflict me while I'm reciting dua al-Joshan. We said that Allah will protect you from theft, Allah will protect you from fire and ultimately Allah Azza wa Jal protects us from the fires of hell. So all these protection that we receive from Dua Al-Joshan Al-Kabir and that's why the name is given to it, the Dua of the Great Protection. Joshan we said armor protection. Tonight I want to focus and analyze the content of this beautiful Dua. Because number one, when you understand and study a dua, you begin to appreciate it much more than when it becomes just a ritual. I read something that I don't understand. And this is a problem with many duas. Many of us, we read dua kumail and we don't know what we're saying. We read, for example, dua al-sabah and we don't understand what we're saying. We recite dua Abu Hamza al-Thamali, we don't understand at all. We recite dua al -iftitah. This is a problem that we have with all of our duas and not just dua, with Qur'an. Many of us have not understood the tafsir of Qur'an. When you do not understand the tafsir of the Qur'an or you don't understand the meanings of the dua, you will not benefit. When you study the dua, you will benefit much more and you will learn to appreciate the dua after you study it. So this is number one. Number two, we said that even though this dua is classified from a rijali perspective as being mursal, remember the missing link between al-kaf'ami and al-imam Zain al-abideen alayhi salam, but if you analyze the meanings of this dua, the content, one would be sure and certain beyond doubt that these are the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Similar to Nahjul Balagha. You know, some sermons of Nahjul Balagha, a Sharif al radi did not tell us how he got it. It is Mursal. But when one reads that khutbah, one sees the eloquence and the power that they know this can only be said by Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Likewise, when we study the dua of Al-Joshan Al-Kabir, one could be certain that these words are so powerful, are so eloquent, are so deep in meaning. They contain so much knowledge, so much wisdom, so much treasures, that these must be the words of Allah, Rasulullah, or one of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam So let's analyze this beautiful dua of Al-Joshan Al-Kabir. Dua Al-Joshan Al-Kabir, is divided into 100 verses. There are 100 verses in this beautiful dua. In each verse, there are 10 titles or names of Allah Azza wa Jal. And verse 55, to be exact, verse 55 contains 11 names and titles of Allah. So if you add all that up, dua al-Jawshan al-Kabir contains how many names of Allah? 1,001 names of Allah in this beautiful dua. There is no better way to invoke the name of Allah than through this dua. Wallahi, you will not find any other dua that contains these many attributes, names and titles of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You will not find any hadith. Search amongst all the books. Search amongst the ahadith of all the Muslims. You will not find one dua that incorporates 1001 names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this beautiful way. Many of us, when we read Dua 
Joshan. We think it's all repetitive. We're saying the same thing over and over again. Okay, I get it. Allah is Rahim. I get it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, for example, merciful. Allah is generous. Allah is powerful. Allah is knowledgeable. And we think that the many verses are as what they call in the Arabic language, tafannun fil ibarah. It's just different ways of saying the same thing, right? While when we study Dua al Joshan, you would find that each verse tells you something new, tells you something different. Each verse teaches us a new attribute of Allah that we did not know before this verse. So there is no repetition. And you know, because of this misunderstanding, sometimes as we progress in this Dua, when we're reading it, in the beginning there is excitement. You see everyone, Subhanak ya la ilaha illa anta al al But as soon as we reach verse 50, 60, 70, people begin. They get bored, correct? Because it's, they think it's repetition. I'm saying the same thing over and over again. And that's why I've heard some people, either this is their lisanul maqal, or as they say, lisanul hal. This is how we feel towards the end of the dua. Instead of saying, khallusna min an nar ya Rab, some people, khallusna min dua al jawshan ya Rab. They just want to finish this dua and go back home. Why? Because to them, this is just repetition. I'm saying the same thing over and over again. While when you study dua al joshan al-kabir, you find every verse is telling you something different. Study it and then read it. Wallahi, you will enjoy the pleasure of reciting dua al joshan such that you would wish it wasn't just 100 verses, it was 200 verses. Like we said last night, al-allama al-mullah hadi subzawari. He says, when I study, I did it, not just read it. You will read it a thousand times, but you will not benefit. He said, when I sat down to study Dua al joshan al-Kabir, he said, I found and extracted so many hidden gems and treasures that I fell in love with this beautiful Dua. Such that we said he would recite it in his Qunut every day. Every day he would recite one verse of the 100 verses in his Qunut. Because he understands the meanings of this beautiful Dua. The meanings are very, very delicate and very beautiful as you will see inshallah. So 100, 100 verses all remembering the names of Allah, 1001 names. And after each verse... We implore the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We say together, Subhanaka ya la ilaha illa ant. Al ghawth, al ghawth, khallisna min al nari ya rab. We say, Glory be to you, Allah, the one and only God. You see the tawheed, every verse, the one and only God. We ask you to help us, to help us and save us and protect us from the fires of hell. And what's beautiful about Dua al joshan what makes it unique to all the other du'as is that most of the other du'as, you have one reciter who takes the microphone and he recites all of it, correct? While in Dua al joshan everyone participates. You find it is an interactive du'a. It is a communal du'a. It shows the beauty of the community. It shows the beauty of the congregation. While one reciter reads the verse, after that, everyone follows and says, Subhanaka ya la ilaha illa ant. Al ghawth, al ghawth, khallasna min al nar ya rab. So maybe in other du'as, you begin to doze off because the reciter is reading and reading and reading. Dua al joshan, as soon as you doze off, it's your turn to speak and say, Subhanaka ya la ilaha illa ant. It's a beautiful du'a we have to focus on, brothers and sisters. And when it comes to this beautiful dua of Al Joshan Al Kabir, you find <clears throat> that this dua is very delicate. It is very delicate and precise in both its words and its meanings. What do I mean? It's delicate in its words, meaning sometimes the difference between Iman and Kufr in this dua is one harakah. Sometimes when I attend some masajid, some reciters, when they recite, instead of praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they start doing kufr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because they have not studied the Arabic language and they cannot read the text correctly. You see, sometimes one haraka, fatha, dhamma, kasra, makes a difference between iman and kufr. Let me give you examples from the Quran. Allah says in the Holy Quran, Surah at tawbah and know and Allah bari'un min al mushrikeen and know that Allah is bari he disavows he disassociates and condemns whom the mushrikeen after that and then says Allah says wa rasuluh or wa rasuluh you may say who cares rasuluh rasuluh 
Who cares? The difference between Rasuluh and Rasuluh is the difference between Iman and Kufr. Why? Because if you were to say, أَنَّ اللَّهَ بَرِيءٌ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ وَرَسُولُهُ That means Allah and His Prophet, they what? Condemn the Mushrikeen. This is Iman and this is how the verse should be read. But if someone doesn't understand the Arabic language, doesn't understand the harakat and the Arab, and does not read it correctly, says, أَنَّ اللَّهَ بَرِيءٌ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ وَرَسُولُهُ This is kufr. Why? Because now the Prophet becomes the object. Now the verse would be saying Allah condemns two. He condemns the mushrikeen and he condemns his messenger. This would become kufr. Allah bari' min al-rasul. This becomes kufr. How do we extract this and know this? From one harakah. When you say rasuluh, it means the prophet disavows them. When you say rasuluh, that means Allah condemns the prophet. This is one example of how one harakah can make a big difference in our understanding of iman and kufr. Let me give you another example. In another verse we, re we read, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ or اللَّهُ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاء Which one is it? Laha or Lahu? One of them? Very good guess. Obviously it's one of them. So we know it's not Lahi. So is it Lahu or Laha? Let me hear an answer. So Laha. Ahsad. If we were to if we were to recite the verse and Allah wait which was which verse was it Inna yakhsha Allah min ibadihi al-ulama Allah becomes the object so the meaning would be that indeed the ulama fear only Allah which is iman which is the correct meaning while if you were to say Inna ma yakhsha Allah Allah becomes the fa'il that means you're saying that Allah fears the ulama which is it the ulama fear Allah or Allah fears the ulama? Obviously, the ulama fear Allah. That difference and that discrepancy and the meaning is all extracted from one harakah. If you say Allah, that means ulama fear Allah. If you say Allah, that means Allah fears the ulama and that would be kufr. This is a second example. Let me give you a third example. In another verse we read, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذِ ابْتَلَى إِبْرَاهِيمَ رَبُّهُ <coughs> إِبْرَاهِيمَ رَبُّهُ or إِبْرَاهِيمُ رَبَّهُ One way you can read it, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ابْتَلَى إِبْرَاهِيمَ رَبُّهُ Correct? This is the correct way of reading the Quran. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was the one that Tested Ibrahim. So Allah is the fa'il, Ibrahim is the maf'ul. Some people, they don't know the qawa'id, they don't read it right. They say, the ibtala Ibrahimu rabbahu. Ibrahim was the one that tested Allah, which becomes kufr. So just understanding the importance of the harakat, the i'rab in the Arabic language, is the difference between iman and kufr. Now in the Quran, this is clear. <clears throat> Come to dua al-jawshan al-kabir. Dua al-jawshan al-kabir, same thing. Unfortunately, I go to some communities, some reciters do not know how to read the harakat. That's why, brothers and sisters, I know we all want to read and it's an honor to recite publicly, you know, in the masjid. Some people have a nice voice, but it's not just about the voice. We have to always choose people that read it correctly because if they read it wrong, it'll be kufr. Let me give an example. In one verse of Dua al Joshan al Kabir, we say about Allah, Ya man yara wa la yura. يَا مَنْ يُطْعِمُ وَلَا يُطْعَمْ يَا مَنْ يَخْلُقُ وَلَا يُخْلَقْ You know how many times I've been to communities that some reciters read it the opposite? What are we reading? We're saying Allah is the one that sees but He cannot be seen. He is the one that feeds but He is not fed. He is the one that creates but He was not created. Sometimes I've been to communities where the reciter says يَا مَنْ يُرَى وَلَا يَرَى يَا مَنْ يُطْعَمْ وَلَا يُطْعَمْ يَا مَنْ يُخْلَقْ وَلَا يَخْلُقْ وَالْعِيَادُ بِاللَّهِ أَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهِ رَبِّي وَتُوبُ لَيْهِ They say that Allah is the one that He cannot see but He is seen. Allah is the one that cannot feed but He is fed. Allah is the one that cannot create but He was created. Why are they saying this? Because of the harakat. If you change the harakat in a small way, iman, dua becomes a session of kufr. And that's why the reciters have an obligation. They have to know how to read correctly. And imagine if one day a Muslim from another school of thought comes. You know, I said last night, one of the beauties of Dua al-Jawshan, all Tawheed, right? So no Muslim, even no Wahhabi can come and say there is shirk 
there is tawassul, there is shafa'ah. No, it's all Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But imagine they come and they see that we're saying, Ya man, ya man yura wa la yara. Ya man yukhlaq wa la yakhlaq. So this shi'ar kuffar, because they are reading all this kufr. The reciter does not know because of his ignorance. So going back to the point, dua al jawshan is a very delicate dua. Delicate means we have to be very careful. When it comes to the words, and when it comes to the meanings. What do I mean the meaning? This is what's important and we have to discuss tonight. As I said, some of us think that there are 100 verses and each verse 10 names, 1,000 names. We think that it's all repetition. We say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what is Rahim. We say it in 10 different ways. We say Allah is powerful in 10 different ways. Correct? When we do not understand... When we do not study Dua al Jawshan correctly, this is what happens. Take the book of Al Mullah Hadi Subzawari, 1000 pages, how he analyzes, studies, and does sharh, commentary of this beautiful dua. Wallahi, you would see there is no dua that explains Allah, his attributes, like Dua al Jawshan al Kabir. And I will just give you one example because I have no time. I can do 10 lectures on this, but I will just give you one example tonight. I will give you the example of the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what is forgiving. I began the first night of my majalis speaking about the fact that Ramadan, the month of Ramadan is the month of forgiveness. It is a month of rahma, a month of forgiveness. And one of the greatest ways we see, we understand the forgiveness of Allah is through Dua al Joshan al Kabir. How? It's one thing to say Allah is Ghafoor, Ghaffar. It's one thing to say Allah forgives. But it's another thing to look at the different levels and ways in which Allah forgives you in Dua al Joshan al Kabir. How? Five levels of forgiveness we see in Dua al Joshan al Kabir. Don't think it's repetition. Number one, we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes uses the word Ya Ghafir. Ghafir. What is Ghafir? Ghafir is the one that forgives. This is one of the attributes of Allah. So Allah says Ya Ghafir. Ya Ghafir al khati'at Ya Ghafir al sayyat Focus on this Laylatul Qadr on the meaning when inshallah Laylatul Qadr comes. So what is Ghafir? Ghafir means Allah is the one that is forgiving. Does it stop there? No. This is the first level. Is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives, meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not punish you for your sins. This is one level of Allah's forgiveness. And then you come to a second level. You find another verse. Allah says, Ya, ghafir, ya khayr al ghafirin. Allah is not just ghafir. You and I can also be ghafir. Allah is khayr al ghafirin, meaning Allah is the best of forgivers. You and I can also forgive. We spoke about this the first night. But what? We hold grudges. Allah does not hold a grudge. What do I mean? The ulama say there are three levels of ghufran. Three levels of forgiving. And this can be extracted from one of the verses of the Holy Quran. In chapter 64, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِن تَعْفُ وَتَصْفَحُ وَتَغْفِرُ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورٌ رَّحِيمٌ Allah says that if someone wrongs you, if someone does zulum to you, you can retaliate, correct? You have the right to retaliate, justice. But the Quran says, but if you forgive, it's better. How do I forgive? The Quran tells us three levels of forgiveness. Number one, the Quran says, What is afu? Afu means you ignore. Imagine someone comes and he disrespects me. I just ignore him and walk. I don't retaliate. Sometimes someone wants to provoke you. He comes and he calls you a bad name. This provokes you and then you retaliate. This is not afu. Afu is like the imams of Ahlul Bayt. When they used to call them names, they would just overlook and go. So afu is that you don't retaliate. You forgive, meaning you ignore that person. This is the first level. This is the easiest level of Forgiving. And then the Quran says, then after that comes a safh What is a safh A safh is a higher level. You don't just ignore. No. You what? You forgive and you forget. Meaning that if you see that person, you don't expose him. You don't remind him. 
You don't keep on telling him you disrespected me. There are some people who ignore, who forgive. They won't retaliate, but they'll go and expose that person. This person did this to me. This person did that to me. This is afu, but this is not saf. Saf means you forget about it. Don't mention it anymore. Even if you see him, you completely forget it. This is what? This is a higher level of forgiving. Not only do you ignore, but now you forget. You don't remind that person, nor do you tell anyone about the volume of that person. And then there's a third highest level of forgiving. The Quran calls it what? And taghfiru. Ghufran. According to some ulama of the tafsir, what is ghufran? The highest level is that not only do you ignore, you don't retaliate, not only do you forget, but you treat that person who oppresses you with kindness. Allahu Akbar. Sometimes you forget. Sometimes you forgive, other times you forget, other times you act as if this person has done you a good deed, like Imam al Hassan. Don't we remember the story of Imam al Hassan? When a man from Sham came to him from the city of Sham, from the area of Sham, and he began to swear at the Imam. He began to disrespect him. The Imam ignored him. He did not retaliate. He didn't tell him, You are this, you are that, like some of us, correct? The Imam not only did Afu, the Imam did صف, meaning the Imam did not even mention it. Why are you saying this? What's wrong? The Imam not only did صف, the Imam did غفران. What is غفران? The Imam smiled in his face and he told him, do you need money? Do you need shelter? Do you need food? So someone wrongs you, but you treat them with kindness. This is the highest level. That you take out all of the grudge from your heart. Even though that person wronged me, I forgive him internally. I don't hold a grudge. I don't hold animosity and hatred. Look at Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. When Al Hur came to him, the Imam did not argue right away. He forgave him externally. That means he didn't say anything. And he forgave him internally, meaning he did not hold a grudge towards Al Hur. This is the highest level of forgiving. You conceal, you don't talk about it. And in fact, you treat that person who wronged you with kindness. As the Holy Quran says. So this is what? This is the highest level of forgiving. Allah Azza wa Jal. Not only is he ghafir. That was level one. Level two, Allah is khayrul ghafirin. What does that mean? When Allah forgives you, he conceals your sins. There is a hadith from an Imam al-Sadiq. The Imam says, إِذَا كَانَ يَوْمُ الْقِيَامَةِ يَلِلَّهِ حِسَابَ الْمُؤْمِنِ حَتَّى يُوْقِفُهُ عَلَى كُلِّ سَيِّئَةٍ مِنْ سَيِّئَاتِهِ Allah tries me on the day of judgment and He shows me my sins, how much sins I have done, hundred, a thousand, some of us hundreds of thousands of sins throughout 70 or 80 years of our lives. And then Allah tells him, look at my rahmah, look at my forgiveness. Not only will I not punish you, I forgive you, I forgive you, I won't punish you for this. But I concealed your sins in the dunya. How many of us, brothers and sisters, we commit so many bad things in private? Allah Azza wa Jal conceals. Allah Azza wa Jal keeps our reputation good. I come to the mosque, everyone thinks I'm holy, I'm good. But they don't know what I do in my house with my wife, with my husband, with my children, with my partners with my friends and my sahrat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what? Sattarul ayub. So Allah tells that believer that in the dunya you committed so many sins but I was the one to conceal. This is from the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And today I will forgive and conceal. On the day of judgment, Allah says, today I will not expose you in front of people. I will conceal your sins so that no one sees them. And in addition, Allahu Akbar, you see the highest level of Allah's forgiveness. Allah tells the abid, not only will I forgive and conceal, I will take those sins and I will change them into good deeds. Ubaddilu sayyatika hasanat, as the Quran says. Ubaddilu Allah sayyatihim hasanat. Allah Azza wa Jal, when He forgives you, He doesn't just say, I will not punish you. He says, remember those sins, I will take them and I will change them into good deeds. Allahu Akbar. This is where you see Allah is khayrul ghafirin. So when the person goes to paradise, people say, Subhanallah, is this a Nabi? Is this a Wali? Is this a Prophet that he has all these good deeds? He doesn't have bad deeds. They don't know. Allah is khayrul ghafirin. He has so many bad deeds. Allah conceals. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives and he changes them into good deeds. Allahu Akbar.
So when you read Dua al Jawsha, know that Allah, number one, is, ga is ghafir. He forgives. And know that He is khayrul ghafirin. He conceals in the dunya. He conceals on the day of judgment. And He changes your bad deeds into good deeds if you repent. This is the second type of forgiveness we read in Dua al Jawsha al Kabir. Does it stop there? No. Number three. We, we read in Dua al Joshan al Kabir that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ghafoor. What's the difference between ghafir and ghafoor? If I don't know the Arabic language, I think it's the same thing. Allah forgives. There is a difference between ghafoor and ghafir. Ghafoor, they say, is sighat mubalagha. Exaggeration, someone that always practices something, always forgives, this person is ghafoor. But what exactly does ghafoor mean? The ulama mentioned, Sayyid Mullah Hadi Subzawari says, ghafoor is the one that forgives big sins. Sometimes, maybe you just committed one sin, but it's a very big sin, like the sin of Al-Hurr ibn Yazid. Al-Hurr ibn Yazid committed one sin. He stopped Imam Hussein from continuing. But that one sin was one of the biggest sins a human being can commit because he caused the death of Imam Hussein. Even that big sin, it's one sin, but it's huge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives. What do we call that? Ghafoor. Allah is ghafoor, meaning no matter how big your sin is, it's one sin, but no matter how big it is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will still forgive it. There is no sin that is greater than the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in fact, there's a story about this. There's a hadith that happened during the time of Rasulullah. This shows you, this story shows you how Allah is ghafoor. The Holy Prophet went to the house of Ma'adh. Ma'ad ibn Jabal, or if I can, if maybe it's the opposite, Ma'ad came to the house of Rasulullah. Ma'ad told him that, Ya Rasulullah, there is a young man with me by the name of Buhlul. He's crying. He is crying and crying and he's lost all hope. Can you help him? He says, yes, let him come in. Buhlul comes in. The Prophet tells him, what's going on? Why are you crying like this? He tells him, Ya Rasulullah, I have committed a sin. This sin is so big that I know Allah will never forgive me. The Prophet tells him, Ya Buhlul, if your sin is greater than the mountains, it's bigger than the mountains, Allah will still forgive you. Buhlul tells him, Ya Rasul Allah, my sin is greater than the mountains. The Prophet tells him, Ya Buhlul, if your sin that, you, that has made you despondent and hopeless is greater than the world, Allah will still forgive you. Buhlul tells him, Ya Rasulullah, my sin is greater than the world. The Prophet tells him, Ya Buhlul, if your sin is greater than the universe, Allah will forgive you. He tells him, my sin is greater. I can't even mention it. How evil my sin is, how despicable it is. The Prophet tells him, Waihak, what did you do? He tells him, Ya Rasulullah, my job, I'm a grave digger. Every time someone is buried, I would go at night, I would dig that grave and I would steal the kafan. I would live on that. I steal the kafan of that dead person and I would go and sell it. This is how I make my living. That's a terrible job, isn't it? But his sin does not stop there. Look at how grave his sin is. It's unbelievable. He tells him until, Ya Rasulullah, one night, one day I heard one of the women, a young woman from the Ansar died. So to me, that means I have to go and dig her grave and take the kafan. He says, at night when everyone's sleeping, I went and I was digging and digging that grave until I uncovered her. I took her out of the grave and I stole her kafan. As I was leaving, the shaitan came to me and he told me, look, because now she is left without a kafan. Look at her. Look at her beauty. And the shaitan instigated me. Remember we spoke about shaitan last night or the night before? Alhamdulillah, Ramadan, the shayateen are locked up, we said. The shaitan came to me and he started to pressure me and whisper to go and commit the haram act with that dead body. It's already a big sin to commit adultery, to fornicate. But with a dead body, would even a human being do this? He says, I went and I committed the haram and I just left the body like that. He says, as I left, I heard a voice 
telling me, may Allah curse you for what you did to me. May Allah Azza wa Jal curse you and punish you on the day of judgment. It's not enough that you stole my kafan, you had to leave me like this and do that to me. So he tells Rasulullah the story. He tells him, this is my sin. This is how huge it is. You see how big the sin is that even Rasulullah was shocked. The Holy Prophet, even the Prophet who knows how big the Rahmah of Allah and how great it is, he told him, get out of my house because I am afraid Allah will bring down the, the punishment right now upon you and I'm next to you. Leave me alone. Even the Prophet doubted. Rasulullah doubted that Allah may forgive the sin. This is too big. He left felt abandoned by Rasulullah. Who's going to forgive him now? If Rasulullah tell them leave, he goes to a mountain for 40 days. He places his hand on his neck like this and he does munajah 24 hours a day. He says, Ilahi abduka buhlul maghlul. He tied his hands to his neck to show his repentance. When we repent, brothers and sisters, show Allah that you feel the guilt inside you. Show Allah that you feel bad for what you did. Allah forgives you if you show the guilt. So he showed the nadam, the guilt, the remorse. 40 days he would cry and weep to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After 40 days, Jibra'il comes down upon the Holy Prophet and he informs the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, go and tell Buhlul that I have forgiven his sin. Allah brings down a verse where he says, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً أَوْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ ذَكَرُوا اللَّهِ فَاسْتَغْفَرُوا لِذُنُوبِهِمْ وَمَنْ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Go and tell Buhlul that I have forgiven him. The Prophet quickly goes to Buhlul. He tells him, Ya Buhlul, I bring you glad tidings from Allah Azza wa Jal that there is no sin that Allah will never forgive. This is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us that he is what ghafoor. So when we recite in Dua al and you see the word Ghafoor, know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about. That means no matter how big your sin is, Allah Azza wa Jal will forgive you. If you come clean to Allah, you repent and you show that sorrow to Allah, the guilt to Allah, Allah will forgive you. So this is number what? This is number three. We said number one, Allah is Ghafir. In Dua al Joshan, He forgives us. Number two, He is Khayrul Ghafirin. He conceals and He changes your sins into good deeds. Number three, we said Allah is what? Allah is Ghafoor. Number four, the fourth aspect of the forgiveness of Allah that we find in Dua al Joshan al Kabir is what? Allah is Ghafar. We have Ghafir, we have Ghafoor, we have Ghafar. What is Ghafar? Ghaffar, the ulama say, means no matter how many sins you do, Allah will forgive you. Ghaffar means no matter how big and ugly your sin is. Ghaffar is no matter how many sins you have, even if it's a million sins, Allah will forgive you. Muhammad ibn Muslim comes to Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, one of the companions. He asks him about the rahmah of Allah. Al-Imam tells him, إِذَا تَابَ abd if someone commits a sin, but then he repents to Allah, he asks for forgiveness, Allah will forgive him. Muhammad ibn Muslim then asks a very important question. He says, after Allah forgives me, what if I go back to the haram? Many of us, we commit some sins, we feel bad. Correct, Ramadan comes, I feel holy, spiritual, I feel bad. I turn to Allah and I ask Him to forgive me. Allah forgives me. But as soon as Ramadan finishes, I go back right to the haram. How many times after repenting, we go back to the haram? Correct? Muhammad ibn Muslim asked Imam al-Baqir, what if after repenting, I went back to the haram? Will Allah still accept me or no? The Imam says, yes. Allah will accept you the second time. Muhammad ibn Muslim says, what about the third time? Allah repents, I repent, Allah forgives me the second time. And then I go a third time. Will Allah forgive me? He says, yes, Allah will forgive you. But then there must be a time when Allah says enough is enough, right? Imagine if someone comes and he disrespects me. I forgive him. He disrespects me again. I forgive him. He Obviously, there's a time in which I say enough. I have a red line. Where is the red line for Allah? Muhammad ibn Muslim says, How many times can I do a ma'asiyah and then repent? And then do a ma'asiyah? Is this a game? Yani, 
I'm playing with Allah. Ya Allah, forgive me. I won't do it again. And then I do it again. And Imam Al-Baqir tells him, let me tell you the rule. Kullama aada al-mu'minu lidhanb wa staghfar Allah azza wa jal wa tab tab Allahu an. There is no limit. No matter how many times you do a sin and repent, do a sin and repent, do a sin and repent, Allah will keep on forgiving you. What do we call this? Ghaffar. Know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ghaffar. There is no time, there is no instance, there is no circumstance where Allah says enough is enough, I'm not going to forgive you anymore because you are taking advantage of my repentance. This is what? This is ghaffar. And that's why when you read in Dua al joshan you see how precise the words are. One of the titles of Allah is what? One of the titles of Allah is Ya Qabilat Tawbat. Allah doesn't say Ya Qabilat Tawbah, the one who accepts the Tawbah. He is the one who accepts the Tawbat, meaning the many Tawbahs. What does that mean? That means even if you do Tawbah 10, 20, 30, 40 times, and between each Tawbah you sin, Allah will still accept you. Ya Qabilat Tawbat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have a red line. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have any specific numbers where if you cross them, خلاص, I'm not going to forgive you. This is where we understand where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means by ghaffar. And finally, we see a beautiful phrase. One of the beautiful titles of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and dua uh, al-jawshan al-kabir is Allah says, Ya wasi'a al-maghfirah. The maghfira of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is wasi'. Meaning what? Meaning it is ghaffar and ghafur. No matter what type of sin, how big it is, Allah will forgive you. No matter how many sins you have done, quantity, Allah will forgive you. And no matter who you are, Allah will forgive you. No matter who you are, Allah will forgive you. You know there's a hadith that I have heard where one day during the time of Prophet Musa, Iblis, Shaitan, isn't he the most evil person you can think of, the shaitan? He heard Musa speaking about tawbah and repent and no matter how much, Allah, how much you have disobeyed Allah, Allah will forgive you. The shaitan comes to Musa. He says, I have a message for Allah. Can you deliver it? Because Musa would speak directly to Allah. وَكَلَّمَ Allah Musa taklima. He says, yes, what is it? Ask Allah, will Allah forgive me? Shaitan who caused everything. If we're stuck in traffic one day, curse the shaitan. It's because of the shaitan, right? Everything is because of the shaitan. This dunya is because he fooled our grandfather Adam and he was brought down to this word and world. And now he what? He vowed to Allah. Ask Allah, will he forgive me? Musa goes to Allah. Now maybe Musa thought that this is a silly question. Please, Allah forgives him. No way after what he had done. So he goes to Allah as the hadith is reported he told him yeah allah this iblis maybe he probably add the word batran now this guy i don't know what he's thinking i don't know what he's smoking but he wants me to ask you that if he repents and he asks for forgiveness will you forgive the shaitan or no allah azza wa according to the hadith the reported hadith allah told him yes all he has to do is one thing what is it let him do that sujood to adam let him show his humility to me. Musa is surprised, comes back to Iblis. He says, Allah said, yes, just do that sujood to Adam. Shaitan is what? Shaitan is all arrogance. He says, me, do sujood to Adam. No way, never. He goes back to the haram. Even the shaitan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted him. This is where in dua al-jawshan, we see the title that Allah is wasi al maghfirah Meaning there is no one that is too evil for Allah's forgiveness. There is no one that is unworthy of Allah's forgiveness. The people that are not forgiven by Allah are the ones that don't want Allah's forgiveness. They reject it. They say, Ya Allah, we don't want your rahmah. We don't want your forgiveness. We don't want you. In fact, we want to go to hell. What can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do with these individuals? And that's why I mentioned the hadith of Imam Zainul Abidin where he says, Al Ajab kullu al Ajab, mimman halak kayfa halak, ma'asa'ati rahmatullah. 
I wonder how will some people go to hell on the day of judgment? When the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so abundant, when Allah is ghafir, khayru al-ghafirin, ghaffar, ghafur, wasi'u al-maghfira, qabilu al-tawbat, how is it possible? that someone can go to hell. And remember we said Ramadan is the month of rahmah, it's the month of forgiveness. For the smallest acts, Allah will forgive you. Even if you do nothing, Allah forgives you. Thus the Prophet says, الشَّقِيُّ مَنْ حُرِمَ غُفْرَانَ اللَّهِ فِي هَذَا الشَّهْرِ الْعَظِيمِ Pathetic, miserable is the one who Ramadan comes and finishes and Allah does not forgive that individual. So this year, brothers and sisters, when you recite Dua al-Jawshan al-Kabir, Focus on these meanings. Do not think that it is all repetition. I am just saying again and again, Allah is forgiving, Allah is forgiving, Allah is forgiving. No, each time that we mention the forgiveness of Allah, we are speaking about one of the aspects, one of the aspects and one of the sides and one of the ways that Allah forgives us. And this is just with what? With maghfirah. I can do a lecture about, for example, the power the Qudra of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the different types of the Qudra of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you see in what? In Dua al-Jawshan. I can do a lecture for example on the ilm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah, if you study Dua al-Jawshan, you become a mujtahid, a'allama. <clears throat> and that's why I said Al-Mullah Hadi Sabzawari, he takes this Dua, he does a tafsir, a sharh of it, 1,000 pages, 1,000 pages. In fact, some parts I would see he would say that there are some statements in Dua al-Jawshan. Maybe Allah says it in two lines or one line. He says our ulama, they spend years discussing this one line. And I'll just give you one quick snippet, but I won't go into detail. The ulama speak about two types of attributes of Allah. Sifatul Jamal, Sifatul Jalal. I urge you to study this. Sifatul Jamal are the attributes that we affirm that we prove to Allah, meaning Allah is knowledgeable. Allah is omniscient, He is omnipotent, He is generous, He is kind. We are, we are attributing perfections to Allah. This is called what? Sifatul Jamal. And then we have Sifatul Jalal. Sifatul Jalal is when we take away certain attributes from Allah. How? Don't we say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't have a body? Don't we say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, has no spouse? Lam sahibatan wala walada. Don't we say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't have a son? Don't we say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not engage in zulum? What's the difference between Jalal and Jamal? Jamal, we are affirming certain perfections to Allah. When Jalal, we are denying, we are negating certain weaknesses from Allah Azza wa Jal. This is mentioned in Dua al-Jawshan. You know there are books written on this. Books that are taught in the houses, highest levels of houses. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alludes to this in the fourth verse of Dua al-Jawshan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya man lahu al-izzatu wal jamal. And the, Allah explains what, what it is. What is jamal? Allah then says, Ya man lahu al-qudratu wal kamal. Perfection and power. And then Allah speaks about Sifatul Jalal. Ya man lahu al-mulku wal jalal. Allah doesn't only contain the Sifatul Jamal, He also possesses the Sifatul Jalal. And I can delve into this. But the point is, brothers and sisters, when you study Dua al-Jawshan al-Kabir, you fall in love with it. And you begin to appreciate these beautiful meanings. And you begin to what? You begin to appreciate Allah more. Because the more you understand Allah, the more you fall in love with Him. And that's why Imam Ali says, أَوَّلُ الدِّينَ مَعْرِفَةُ اللَّهِ The first step of religion is ma'rifah of Allah. Know Allah. The more you know about Allah, the better you will worship Him. And the more you will seek nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I ask Allah the Almighty to bless us all during this blessed month of Ramadan, and I ask him to give us the ability and the tawfiq that we can concentrate and focus on these beautiful meanings when we recite Dua al-Jawshan al-Kabir during this beautiful month. Uh -huh.